Well, it's good to be back. I got, uh, I left Oregon. I was there for Thanksgiving with my grandkids, and Abby, my daughter, uh, is going to be giving birth in January, so that's our eighth grandchild coming, and uh, so it's going to be cool. Every grandchild that's born is another step towards poverty, and... Uh, <laughs> But I left just in time because yesterday it was minus nine and snowing. So I'm glad just got out of there just in time. But we were there for Thanksgiving and I had about 16, 17 of our family together. My sister came up and it was just a wonderful time. Hey, by the way, take a wild guess. How many turkeys do you think Americans consume every Thanksgiving? Take a wild guess. I'll help you out. 45 million, 45 million turkeys die. Do you know why those birds hate you so much? And we spent $2.6 billion on turkey stuffing and accoutrements. Now, although that's a lot, it doesn't hold a candle to what we as Americans are about to spend this Christmas season. Take a wild guess how much Americans will spend this season at Christmas. $456 billion. Retailers make more in this season than they do all the accumulative total of the other 11. Nearly a half a trillion dollars is spent on Christmas things. And not only will we generate a lot of presents, guess what else we're going to generate in America? Rubbish. At, from Thanksgiving to Christmas, at this season, we will generate an extra 25 million tons of rubbish just from the season. That's a lot of rubbish. Yeah, I, I think about my garbage man. I am so grateful for my garbage man. You know, he's so faithful. He comes every week, takes rubbish away. Whatever junk you put in there, he doesn't ever complain. I've never heard him complain. He takes it away and does away with it. In fact, this last Thanksgiving, because we had babies over there, we had loaded diapers. You know what those are? <laughs> loaded diapers with toxic waste in them. In there. And he took it away without complaining. And I thought, man, but how many of you, as faithful as your garbage men are, how many of you know your garbage man's name? Yeah, it's like nobody. Now, wait a minute. And not only has he been so faithful to remove my garbage, even the toxic stuff, vulgar waste in there, even, even though he takes that away, I still don't know his name. Now, what if he did this? What if he took not only your rubbish away, the most obscene rubbish that you would throw in there, junk stuff, sloppy stuff, stinky stuff, hauna stuff, he not only takes it away, but before he returns your rubbish can, what if he washed it out for you? with soap and water. And not only does he take your rubbish away, but he washes it out with soap and water and notices that there's a broken wheel on your rubbish can, kneels down and fixes your tire. And before he puts your rubbish can back, not only does he dump it, washes it out, fixes it, he fills it with food, and on top he puts a Starbucks card. Wouldn't you want to get to know that garbage man's name? Yeah, I'd be waiting out there with cookies every week for him. But I was thinking about that. I was thinking, that's how Jesus is. That no matter what toxic waste I had in me, vulgar and obscene, without complaint, he took it all away. And not only did he do that, he washed my heart out and my soul. And he takes that stuff away and he does it not just once, not twice, but every time and without complaint. Don't you want to get to know his name more? And then when there's something broken, he kneels to fix it. And then he provides for you and me everything that we'll need. Don't you want to get to know him more? Don't you want to know his name? That's what Christmas is all about. That this world who did not know God, that an angel came to a prophet in the Old Testament and revealed to him that there would be 
a virgin that would give birth to a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is Isaiah 7 and verse 6, a prophetic messianic prophecy. Because the world won't be ready to even recognize this Messiah. So he was proclaimed by angels. He would be foretold by the prophets. And when he'd come, he'd even be worshipped by magi. Let's read. It's in your Bible and uh, also in your notes out of the book of Matthew. We're going to read the annunciation or the announcement of the angel about the coming of this Messiah and he proclaims at the top of your notes, let's read it together, Matthew 1, 18, go. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, which means God is not to any other planet, to this planet, God is. There's no other planet in the universe that can call him Emmanuel, just us. He came to us. But when he came, funny thing, nobody had room for him. One verse in the book of Luke, when Mary came, to the end, it says this, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths. Rags is what it is, just old rags. And laid him in a manger or a food trough because there was no room for them in the inn. A woman that's nine months pregnant, the prophets had been foretelling this, comes to an inn, we don't have any room. Uh, excuse me, sir, but my wife, she's about about to give birth. I said, there's no room. But sir, my wife, there's no room. Is there anywhere? There's a barn in back. A barn? Uh, th there's bacteria there. My wife is giving, hey, take it or leave it. Uh, we'll, we'll take it. How much? He went back there and there, the king of kings, the lord of creation, was introduced to the world. And you'd think they would recognize him. The one who was foretold by the prophets. You'd think they'd recognize him. Why, a king should be born in a palace, in a citadel, not, not a stable or a stall. With dirt floors and rough-hewn walls, he should have marble floors, granite walls. And instead of rags to keep him warm, he should have had velvet. He should have had servants scurrying around. Instead, he had animals. No one recognized him. No room in the inn. Hmm. Let me ask you. Do you think you would have recognized him? If Jesus came today, maybe with jeans and a t-shirt, would you have recognized him? We could miss him too, can't you? You see, there's a, something inside of you called a reticular activating system. The reticular activating system is a filter in your brain that filters out extraneous noises so that you don't have to listen to it. And the same thing can be true with our flesh. When we come to, to just start to mature a little bit, our flesh has a tendency to filter God stuff out. And you've got to disengage that so that you can begin to recognize God. For example, right now, I want you to listen to the air conditioner and some of the projectors. Listen. Hear all that? You hear the noise up there, the air moving. You see, you didn't hear it before, but now you're going to hear that buzz and this over here. You're going to hear it because I turned off your reticular activating system, and you're going to hear that nauseatingly all morning now, and you're going to be mad at me because I disengage your reticular activating system. But you see, those things happen even in our flesh with God. We start to filter God out, get God out of the marketplace, get God out of the state, get God out of the government, get God out of the schools, and pretty soon we can't recognize him anymore. Would you recognize him? Would there be room in your inn 
Well, I'm not an innkeeper. Well, is there room in your calendar? Is there room in your schedule? Is there any room? Would you recognize him? Your future depends on it. I'm going to show you a video that uh, will help you to see how uh, successful and prosperous you're going to be in business. Because in business, you have to recognize certain things. And if you miss it, then you'll miss opportunity. So in the short video, I, it's going to require a little bit of math. So I'm sorry, you're going to have to concentrate a touch. But the narrator is going to give you the answer after a few minutes, uh, a few seconds actually. But see if you can match up. But you'll have to pay attention now because this will determine whether or not you have a propensity to be successful in business. Let's take a look. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! That was a test. How many of you, be honest, did not see in the first segment the moon walking bear? Raise your hand. Hold your hands up. Look around. Yeah. You know, I thought when I saw it the first time that they actually inserted the bear in the second one, but I checked it out. It's in there on the first one. But we can't see it because we're not looking for it. If you're not looking for God, he can be right in front of you and you'll miss him. Absolutely, completely miss him. And that's exactly what the people did at that first Christmas time. There was no room in the inn. No one recognized him to the point where we missed him completely. But remember, he chose of all the planets in the galaxy to be Emmanuel, God with us, to just one speck of dirt. And he chose us. And we still didn't recognize him. Imagine with me. Now, I don't know if there's extraterrestrials out there somewhere, ETs, I don't know. But, but in the solar systems and the galaxies of billions of stars and planets of hundreds of light years long, uh, ma imagine with me, all right? Just imagine with me. An alien, extraterrestrial, is coming to visit the Earth. In fact, he's about to appear right here at New Hope. And all of a sudden, alien stands here with spiky hair, little radars, and, and, and whoa, we say, you look like an alien. I uh, guess I am. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Delta Centauri. Uh, where's Delta Centauri, I say? Oh, it's about 200 million light years away from Earth. Whoa, are you here to destroy us? Oh, no, I'm just a galaxy reporter. Because we found that there's life forms here on this earth and we've been studying and following you. We just want to know if there's anything good happening here. Well, what do you mean? I mean, is there anything big that's happened here on the earth ever? Oh, yeah. I mean, we discovered the internet. <laughs> the internet? You mean the way you communicate now? That's so archaic. That's as old as dial tone, dial up. That's terrible. In fact, right now we have mental formulation. Watch this. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Right there out in front in the middle of nowhere comes a digital readout. And he asks a question and it's answered. Whoop, and then disappears. He says, well, we do that with our minds. Your internet is old. It's terribly old. It's archaic, obsolete. Is there anything big? Well, well, we've developed a jet that can fly the speed of sound. 
The speed of sound, that's only 768 miles an hour. We don't even measure things in miles an hour. That's like a walk around the park. We have molecular transfer now. Remember the Beam Me Up Scotty movies? Well, we just transfer molecules and then reestablish them in another space. Whoa, well, okay. Is there anything big that's... A, well, uh, hey, we almost reached a half a trillion dollars in retail sales this Christmas. <laughs> half a trillion, that's nothing. And when? Uh, uh, Christmas. See the lights and the trees? Oh, yeah, I saw them everywhere. What's that about? Oh, we're celebrating Christmas. Whoa, he says, did you say like Christmas? Oh, uh, yeah, Christmas, we say Christmas. You mean... Christ the Messiah? Uh, yeah. You mean Yahweh? Elohenu? Adonai? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess. You mean he came here to this speck of earth? We've been following that prophecy for years and years, millions of years. We're trying to find out which planet he was born to, which planet he was Emmanuel. It's only one Emmanuel, God with us. Only one planet gets that privilege. You mean to tell me he came here? Uh, yeah. Whoa, now that is big. All of the galaxies should know about this one. What did you do? Was he born in a palace, a big citadel? Uh, no, um, a barn. Barn? No, no. It's got to be a palace. This must have been a citadel. It must have been as big as a city. Was there a coronation? Was there a huge celebration? I mean, all of the earth must have come out. Didn't it just change people's hearts? Why? This must be the most fabulous place in the universe. Tell me, how was the celebration? What did you do? Did you put a crown on his head? Did you put velvet shoes on his feet? What did you do? You got to take me to the palace. You got to take me. Uh, well, there is no palace. No, there's got to be. Oh, no, well, there was no place to even lay his head and rest. Oh, no, no, no. There's got to be a citadel. You got to take me there. What did you do? How was the celebration? Tell me, what did you do with him? Uh, oh, we, we killed him. <laughs> you what? Uh, we didn't recognize him, you know that. We just, we didn't we didn't recognize him. Have you seen those sci-fi movies where aliens come to Earth to destroy the world? I think they found out what we did with the Creator. <laughs> and if they destroy us, we deserve it. You see, there's only one planet in the galaxy that can call him Emmanuel. And yet, we didn't recognize him. He came incognito. Why? Because he was trying to hide? No, because we didn't recognize him. Well, how do you not do that anymore? Oh, that's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is to remind us that the Emmanuel is coming. Can you recognize him? So we've lost that meaning. But that's really what Christmas is. And not only in the Bible, but in your life. How often the Lord will appear to you and to me and speak through a child or a sermon or, or a person or a setback. Can you hear his voice? Can you see that he's talking and moving? Because your future depends on your ability to recognize the presence of Emmanuel. Well, how is it then, how can we learn so that we don't miss the Messiah again like of old? Well, in order to learn those lessons, we're going to slip into a prison cell with Peter in Acts chapter 12. Here he's going to have an encounter with God that at first it's incognito. But watch what he teaches us through his actions because the very first thing that he's going to teach us is that we have to develop an ability to listen for his voice. Let me give you some context. Herod was the overseer of the emperor. Uh, there were tetrarchs and there was the Caesars, emperors. Now what the Romans did was they, in order to give greater credence to their leaders so that it forced or mandated obedience, they made their emperors demigods. A demigod meant that you as an emperor now is half God, half man. So if you disobeyed an emperor, it's like disobeying one of the gods. 
He would speak with the voice of gods. Well, the Romans hated Christians. You know why? Because Christians said, there's only one God and it ain't you. We're not going to worship multiple amount of gods. There is one God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the Romans hated that because they were revealing, surfacing what they really were, just fleshly human beings, and they didn't like that. So Herod got a hold of James, one of the disciples, slew him with the sword, and when the Jews saw it, they loved it. They said, oh, kill them all, kill all those Christians. So he got a hold of Peter, threw Peter in prison, put him under guard arrest. His, his desire and his plan was to pull him out the next day, bring him before the people, and if they wanted him killed, he was going to kill him as well. So he was basically on death row for the evening. But something was about to happen. A miracle was in the making, but Peter has no idea. So, the first thing he's going to teach us is, would you write in your notes, number one, he's going to say to us, you've got to learn to listen for his voice. Listen for his voice. Let's read what takes place. Acts chapter 12, verse 7, would you read it with me? Go. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his... The chains what? Fell off his... There's going to be times where God may strike you on the side and say, Get up quickly. Do this quickly. And when you know and recognize his voice and obey, that which has bound you will be released. There are some of you that are being obsessed by a certain relationship or addicted to a drug that you just want to get rid of, just to stop. You know it's binding you. And God may say to you in one of these services, I want you to do this quickly. I want you to do this now. And if you kick the, the can down the road, the chains remain. You can go to church a thousand times, but until you learn to recognize, that's God saying. And when he says, get up quickly, you move quickly. When that happens, freedom begins and the chains are broken. How often we just delay and we wonder why God is so slow. God's going to speak, and often he'll say, get up quickly. Don't put it off. Do it now. Uh, there's a story of a mother who goes into her son's room and says, get up quickly. We're going to church. He said, I ain't going to church today. She said, yes, you are. No. Why? Because people at that church, they don't like me. They don't listen. They don't even care. The mother said, no, people at that church do like you. They do listen. They are caring. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, people there do like you. They do listen and they do care, she says. And besides that, you're the pastor. Get up. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be times that God will at times say to you, move quickly. You know what I've learned? I've learned that when God is speaking to me to go to a prayer meeting or a Bible study or church service, and for some reason there's going to be times you're going to have this overwhelming lethargy, like, no, I'm just way too tired today. I have learned this, that when I have this overwhelming feeling to just chill, I've learned something, and that is this. The devil cannot read people's minds. But he knows what's going on. He knows what's spoken, let's say, on a Saturday night service. And as much as God loves you, Satan hates you. You need to understand that. Because your redemption, every time he looks at you, your redemption and salvation reminds him of his defeat on Calvary. You're the result of God's redemption plan. And you are hated. 
And the way to get back at Jesus, because he can't get back at Jesus, is he's going to get back at his kids. That's his insidious way of getting back at Christ. So as much as God loves you, Lucifer hates you. And if he knows, because he's listened to the Saturday, Saturday night message, for example, and he knows that there's a phrase that you will respond to if you hear and chains will fall off your hands, if he knows that, he's going to make sure that you feel so tired and so slothful that you will stay there because he knows if you hear this, it will begin to set you free. And I have found that when I feel overwhelming lethargy to respond to something I know God is asking me to do, I redouble my efforts and get there as fast as I can because I know something is going to be said that this boy needs desperately to hear. Get up quickly. Get up quickly. Well, you say, well, Wayne, how do I learn to hear his voice because I, I there's so many voices happening here it is the best way to learn to recognize his voice is learn to read your bible because you see this is called the word of god and sorry ken this is the true bible creed this is my bible the word of god and i boldly declare that this is the highest law in the land I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I do what it says I do. Why? Because I am a citizen of heaven. The more you read the word of God, the more you know what God sounds like. And when he speaks, I know that that's God. Because you're going to hear a lot of voices. Some will masquerade, disguise itself as a counterfeit God. But you'll need to know the difference. Well, how will I know the difference? Whether it's the devil talking or God. Read the Bible. In the olden days, they used to teach people how to identify counterfeit money. Today, we have technology. Hold it up to a certain light. We have a pencil with a certain chemical in it. And we put a line on it and see how it reacts to the ink. But in those days, they didn't have technology. So you know what they did? They didn't show you a counterfeit bill. They would set a potential inspector in front of a conveyor belt filled not with counterfeit, but the real stuff. Let's say $10 bills. They would pass $10 bills in front of you, and you can take it. I want you to touch it. I want you to crumple it up. I want you to feel it. You can tear it. You can smell it. You can eat it if you want to. But I want you to be inundated with the real thing. Crumple that one up. Go ahead. Fold it. Fold it. Unfold it. All right. And they had all ages of bills there. Brand new ones, old ones, crumpled up ones. And you just worked with that, smelled it, got to know it all day long. And then the next day they say, oh, we're going to introduce a little bit of, just a few counterfeits in there. Well, oh, are you going to show us what a counterfeit looks like? Uh, no. Uh, are you going to give us a class on counterfeits? Uh, no. We're just going to put it in there at random. Well, how will we know it? Mm -hmm. Just going to put it in random. And so they would sit before that conveyor belt, and on would come the $10 bills. And, and one would come down, and they would grab one and say, you know, the coloring on this is just not right. Something's not right. And they would take another one and crumple it and say, uh-uh, this doesn't crumple correctly. So something of the texture of the fabric in this. And they would take another one and they would take a look at it and hold it. The weight of this, not right. It's just a little heavier. The stock is wrong. And they would pick out all of these counterfeit bills. How did they know which ones were counterfeit? Because they studied the counterfeit? Because they were exposed to it? No, because they knew the real stuff. And you see, the more you read God's word and know his voice and know the way he responds, when a counterfeit comes along, you'll say, you know, that voice, something not right about it. Oh, yeah, they're using the word love and this, all the right words, but there's just something not correct 
about the weight of those statements. Well, how do you know it's not right? How do you know that it doesn't ring true? Because I know what does ring true. Do you understand? If you don't know his word and what his voice sounds like, you'll never be able to know what the devil's voice sounds like. And it'll get mixed up. That's why John chapter 10 says this, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they know me. A stranger's voice they will not hear because they know not the voice of a stranger. Pretty interesting. Whose voice do they know? My voice. Guy came to me and said, does God speak to you, Wayne? Oh, every day. Every day? Yeah, every day. You hear him every day? Uh-huh. Whoa, what does he sound like? I said, he sounds just like the Bible. <laughs> and when you do your devotions, you start to hear him speak to you. This last week, I was up Thanksgiving with one of my grandsons, and uh, his name is Zachy. He's five years old. <laughs> and, and Zach... Uh, uh, Go, is just starting at a Christian school. And uh, he was at the, the, the kitchen table, and I, I asked him, how do you like school, Zach? And Zach's, oh, he calls me Papa. He said, Papa is good. I said, it's a Christian school? Yeah, Papa. I said, well, what do you learn? He says, I learn about God. I said, God? You really? And I thought, thought I'd play the devil's advocate with him. I said, really? You learn about God, huh? Yeah. I said, well, who is this God? I said, well, Papa, he made the world. I said, oh, that's big. That is big. I mean, do you know how big it is to make the world? He said, Papa, he can make even bigger stuff than the world. He made the stars and the moon. I said, oh, I don't know about that, Zachy. You, I think he might be able to make like a bicycle, but the stars and the moon, that's big. He said, Grandpa, he can make something as big as himself. He said, whoa, that would be like a miracle. He said, yeah, God does miracles. I said, oh, no, Zachy, that's, that's huge, that's huge. He said, no, he can. I said, no, I don't think he can. He said, Papa, he can. I said, I don't think so. And then he looked really serious at me like this, and he said, Papa, read your Bible. <laughs> okay. I will. <laughs> How do you listen for his voice? Read your Bible. Because then you begin to discern the voice of God. The second thing Peter is going to teach us is that the angel is going to come and give him instruction without him even knowing what the outcome is going to be. But what Peter is going to say, and would you write this down, number two, he's going to tell us, obey what you know. God's not going to hold you accountable to obey what you don't yet know. He's not going to hold you accountable to obey stuff you've never heard about. He's just going to say, obey what you know. In other words, what has God already said to you? What has God already dealt with you on and you've kicked the can down the road for months and months and months? Start with what He's already revealed to you. Because if I can't obey what he's already revealed to me, why should he reveal anything more? Because if I cannot obey what I know, he knows that I won't obey what I don't know. So why should he tell me any more? I won't do it. So start by obeying what you know, not what you don't. And that's what we're going to find from Peter. Watch how he obeys, even though he doesn't know the outcome. Every step of the way, let's read this, go. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. Next. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. He has no idea what the outcome is. You see, God hardly ever shows you the result of what he's asking you to do. Because if he did, hey, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. If you don't, oh, here's the consequences. 
then you'll do stuff, but it wouldn't require any faith. God wants us to move by faith, Hebrews 11.6 says. So often he doesn't show you the outcome. He just says, do this and do that. Now, let me read to you the rest of the story. It's pretty interesting. He didn't know what was being done to him by the angel was real because he thought he was just still in a dream. It was a vision. That's what he thought. But yet, when he continued to follow, he passed the first and second guard, and the guards didn't see him. Like God closed their eyes. And then he came to the iron gate leading into the city, and it opened up for them on its own accord. And they went out and went along the street, and immediately the angel left him, and Peter came to himself and said, Now I know that the Lord sent this angel, and the Lord has rescued me from the hand of Herod. Like, now I see a miracle has been in motion. Now let me ask you, what if Peter, rewind the tape, didn't obey? Now he didn't know that there was an, a miracle happening. What if an angel came, boom, hit him in the side, roused him, boom, get up quickly. Shut up, I like sleep. Put on your sandals. No, you put on your sandals. Get your cloak around you. I'm not cold. Follow me. You follow yourself. <laughs> if Peter had not obeyed, what would have happened to the miracle? Gone. Listen carefully. Some of you right now are in the midst of a miracle. In your family, maybe your marriage, maybe a job, maybe your health. And God's going to ask you to do things very specifically. But your obedience or lack will determine the outcome of this miracle. But if you'll listen and you'll recognize God's voice, you'll be able to obey him even though you don't know the outcome. And one day, you'll turn around and say, wow, that was a miracle. How often we see people obeying God along the way. And then we say, wow, look how their life has turned out. It must have been a snap miracle. No, it wasn't. It was something that started way back here and they chose to obey. I wonder how many miracles we have missed. I wonder. Just because we thought, oh, we'll just leave it. Like, nobody will know. It's like not that big of a deal. I can kick the can down the road. And yet God was in the midst of a miracle with you and your obedience would determine the outcome of that. I wonder how many miracles we missed because we didn't recognize the voice of God and what he was saying to, to the point where we would obey step by step. I want to encourage you this season, let's make Christmas what it should be, to begin to recognize he who is among us, to obey when we even, even when we can't see because we know there's a miracle in motion. And when Peter got out on the street, he was thrilled because of what God has done. And then what was his response? Did he just sit down and have coffee? No. He zipped out to Mary's house to proclaim what God had done. Would you write down a number three? Let his presence change the way you live. Let his presence change the way you live. I mean, what, let what God is saying to you now, is it changing you at all? Have you significantly changed when God has spoken to you? Or you kind of been the same the last year, no matter how much God has spoken? Because you see, if we don't change when he speaks to us, why should he speak to us anymore? <laughs> then you stop hearing his voice because he knows that if he speaks to you, you're not going to do anything about it anyway. And we dull our own ears. The question is, have you significantly changed over this last year because of God's touch on your life or his voice or his word? 
That's why when you're reading in the Life Journal, I've watermarked almost on every page, how will I live differently today because of what I just read? That's this. Because if you will change due to what God has said to you, it will delight him so much he'll keep speaking to you. Because he's changing us from glory to glory into his image. Let his presence change you. And that's exactly what we find here in the 12th verse. And when he realized that this was an angel or that God was speaking, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together. God's going to speak to you, maybe through a message, a phrase. Take that and let it change you. He might be saying to you today, get up quickly, now. Do what I've been asking you to do. You've been kicking it down the road for fear of man, fear of reprisal, fear of whatever, but get up now. And when you do, chains begin to fall off. And when you obey him at every turn, you may very well be in the midst of a miracle that you desperately need for your future. And let his presence change you. Live differently as soon as you leave this place. Make the decision. Bang, bang, bang. Because when you do, God starts to reveal to you tons more because it just delights him when his children recognize his presence. Let me finish with a story that I've told before. A father was having a, a little bit of a relationship problem with his son, 12 years old. His son just wanted to watch TV all the time, and the father wanted to spend time with him. He was building a stone wall out back, and so he said to his son, Hey, son, come and help me. I want to watch TV, he said. No, 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 let's, let's build a stone wall together so every time we see the stone wall out here in the yard, it will remind us that you and I did this together. I don't want to. Oh, come on, come on, it'll be fun. And so he would show his son how to turn the stone around to find the flattest spot so it would be the face of the wall and how to turn stones to fit in such a way that it would make a wonderful wall, how to pull the string, how to level it all. But the son would just sit back at a distance and stand there. Wanting his son to be involved somehow, he saw a boulder, a small boulder over here, and he said, son, go, go, go get that boulder and roll it over here. It'll be perfect right here in the wall. I don't want to. No, 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 go ahead. Come on, you can do it. So the son went over there, and the boulder was a little bigger than he'd realized. He pulled and tugged, and it wouldn't move much. And so he let it back down, boom. He could bring it up about four inches, and boom. I can't move it, he said. Oh, try everything. Go for it. I can't. I tried. No, 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 no. Exhaust all possibilities. Try it, son. You can do it. So the son tried it again and worked as hard as he could. Boom. I can't do it, I said. No, oh, try everything. Try that stick over there. So he grabbed that stick, and he pulled on it, and pow! Stick broke and threw it down in haste and anger. I said, I can't move it. Oh, try everything. I tried everything. Won't move. Oh, you haven't tried everything. Yes, I have. No, you haven't. What haven't I tried? Father said, you haven't tried asking me to help you. You see, if we don't recognize the heart of the presence of our Father, you can have the power of the universe at your disposal, but it will never ever help you unless you recognize the presence of God, Emmanuel. To be able to respond. Otherwise, he'll just come and go incognito, won't he? And all of the power of the universe was right there and you missed it. This Christmas, let's change. Let's, let's learn to hear his voice. Obey him even though you don't see the outcome. Because I know this is God speaking, because I know his voice. Read the Bible, learn what he sounds like, and ask him for help. And when you do, your future will change. Your destiny may change, because that's what Christmas is really all about. Amen? Amen. Amen.